Okay, uh, so hi everyone, this is Finance Meets Real Estate. Um, so I'm Stefan Svetkov. We meet here every Tuesday, 6.30 p.m. Eastern time. We do live webinars and we are also a YouTube channel. So this uh, um, today meeting and lecture is gonna be on YouTube. Uh, Finance Meets Real Estate on YouTube. And um, yes, yeah, so today we have an amazing guest. So um, here, so it's Dan um, Sean Beichler, or do I pronounce it correctly? <laughs> Sean Beichler. Very good. Okay. Cool, cool. Uh, yeah, it's kind of a German surname, right? I guess. Uh, yeah. In a way. <laughs> so yeah, so so Dan, uh, so he's he lives in New Jersey, in Bergen County, New Jersey. So he's. Um, because he, he's a co-GP on uh, over 1,100 uh, units in multifamily, in totally 155 million in value. So he has background in financial services and commercial residential real estate. And um, so, yeah, so he first discovered commercial real estate brokering. Um, and then he kind of, that led him into investing later and like a general, like generally amazing real estate career. He's the founder of uh, Sean, Cap Sean Capital, an investment firm specializing in commercial real estate and other alternative assets. And so today he's going to talk on how a broke agent got into 1,100 plus units and beyond. So I'm very interested <laughs> to hear about it. And um, yeah, so with that, I'm going to pass it on to Dan. And if you guys have any questions, feel free to put them in the chat or just speak up. We're doing an open Q&A format. I'm going to be asking my questions as well. So yeah, the, the floor is yours, Dan. Well, thank you. Pleasure to be here um, and appreciate everyone spending the time on a Tuesday evening to uh, hopefully get a few nuggets of information that'll be useful in your journeys along the way. But yeah, as, as mentioned, um, I'm born and raised in Northern New Jersey, suburbs of New York City, uh, spent about 12 years in Hudson County as a resident and now living in Bergen County. So I never really went far. Uh, college in central Pennsylvania was about the furthest I went, about three hours away. So I uh, ended up mm -hmm. coming right back and, uh, you know, in thoroughly enjoy the area, raising my family. I have two little kids now, uh, my son and daughter, they're going to be four and two this fall. So it's uh, a nice. lot of energy spent and, uh, you know, interesting times. But um, yeah, so when I graduated college in 2005, moved back home, I graduated with a degree I wasn't really sure I wanted to actually use. I actually ended up graduating with a criminal justice degree. Uh, unlike my wife with her fancy uh, degrees here in engineering, in engineer. So uh, I, I wasn't totally certain what I wanted to do with a criminal justice major. It was a little depressing to me towards the end of the curriculum, how they emphasize You'd likely have to be a cop before you get into a lot of the other stuff like FBI or DEA. And it's long hours, low pay, high suicide rate. You'll probably have a drinking and or drug problem. And I was like, uh, oh, that doesn't really sound fantastic. Uh, so I just got kind of an entry level job, kind of a glorified customer service position for a flooring company. And after about a year, I was, the nice thing was, when you're on the ground floor of a company, you're interacting with every scope of the business. So I was dealing with accounting, the warehouse, logistics, uh, you name it. And it was family owned, even though it was a billion dollar company, uh, sorry, half a billion dollar company. And the uh, I worked out of the headquarters. So I would even see, you know, rub elbows with the CEO and vice presidents and stuff. So I got great exposure into the overall business ecosystem. And from there, I realized, I think I want to do sales. And I just didn't find flooring that sexy. So I wanted something that seemed a little more exciting. And coincidentally, one of my good friends from college, he was a finance major. And when he was working at Lincoln Financial in Philadelphia, and he said, I really think you do well in financial services. He's enjoying it. He thinks I'd have the personality and aptitude to do it. So uh even more funny, the following week, I think, I was out at a bar with some friends and bumped into someone from high school who turns out was doing that and with another high school friend's father. He actually turned out he owned a massive, uh, very successful financial advising firm here in New Jersey. 
So I kind of had a leg in. Um, they hired me. I got my Series 6, 63, my life and health insurance license, and I was out. I was uh, running around calling 100 plus people a day, uh, trying to sell life insurance, mutual funds, you know, variable products, stuff like that. And I enjoyed it. Uh, I just so happened to also be a caddy at a country club on the weekends. And a, a new member that joined was a commercial real estate broker. And so, you know, I'm, during the round, I'm essentially uh, prospecting him and chatting him up, learning all about his business. And by the end of the round, I said, you know, I think there's a couple of things you could do to help diversify your, uh, your estate. And he goes, I think that you need to get your real estate license and come work for me. So he and his partner had a $140 million uh, multifamily portfolio deal on the table. They said, get your license, we'll work you in, get you a cut, and you'll be off to the races. And so that's what I did. I quit almost immediately from the financial advising route, Got took the two-week license course, passed the test, fingerprinted and everything, and got started right up in August 2008. In September, my birthday weekend, Lehman Brothers went bankrupt, and 11 of the 18 mortgages were held with Merrill Lynch, and they went out the door as well. So needless to say, the deal crumbled apart. And here I am, where I went from a $30,000 job to a $24,000 plus commission position to now 100% commission only with no deals to be had. So I ended up moving back in with my parents. Thankfully, they didn't retire yet and leave the area. <laughs> so I had a little, a little cushion to land on while I struggled like a lot of the country to figure out what am I going to do in this recession? And again, 2008, so it was election year, shortly after Obama got in. And it was like, okay, what are some of the buzzy things that's going on? And green energy was a big talk, of course. So um, I got into some energy consulting with a former uh, NYMEX trader and uh, some other various odd jobs. Thankfully, still had the caddying at the country club on the side when it wasn't winter time. And uh, even worked night shift at my dad's warehouse. Uh, he worked for Estee Lauder, and uh, that helped me survive for about six to nine months as well, while I'm still banging out phone calls and just nothing's moving on the commercial market. So after a couple of years of this depressing uh, situation, I ended up switching my license over to a residential brokerage in Hoboken, New Jersey, which is where I was previously living before I had to go back in with my parents. And it's, for those that don't know, Hoboken is one square mile town right on the Hudson River across from New York City. So it's just a 10 minute commute into New York City. It's loaded with young professionals, high net worth individuals. I think around now it's somewhere around the 55 to 60,000 residents in that one square mile. And the average household income is over 140,000. So a lot of high net worth people, um, again, commuting to the city, Etc. So I said, let me try residential. While the commercial markets froze up, because if you know we're talking about a lot of money here, so commercial is kind of the first thing to stop. Because oh, my property is losing value, then I'll just not sell it. I'll just keep collecting the cash flow, and when it gets good again, then I can sell. So that doesn't do anything for a broker. We need transactions. So at least people needed to rent apartments or buy or sell their apartments. So uh, switch to a local mom and pop uh, brokerage. Uh, really struggled there. It was almost a full year. I had eight sales fall through for every reason under the sun. Even had my first listing burned to the ground. Uh, a 12 unit building caught on fire. The electrical fire out of the bodega downstairs. So yeah, I had... a. Uh, every sign that I should quit. <laughs> and I don't know if it's the stubbornness of being a uh, Swiss German or um, just the potential I still saw in real estate, but I uh, didn't quit and uh, I kept my license active. I just went part-time for the next couple of years doing advertising sales, but real estate had its hooks in me. I spend every lunch break on LoopNet and the MLS looking for investment properties for all these guys, I caddied and carried their golf clubs at the country club, hoping that I could land a deal or two 
that would allow me to step out and hopefully pay off the debt I've been accruing um, and get back into that as a career instead of just what felt like a hobby at the time. So I uh, spent all that time doing that and everything ended up working out where February, 2013, my uh, previous company laid me off, um, downsized, but I got paid out all these commissions and severance uh, and everything. So I had a little breathing room while I still needed some sort of uh, steady income. I was approaching 30 years old and I had to uh, stop taking as much risk because I had to start planning for the future. But I knew to take risk early on based on Robert Kiyosaki's Rich Dad, Poor Dad. I was fortunate enough that I actually read it at 18 years old. It didn't really sink in with me that real estate's the answer or the vehicle, but the life lesson stuck with me. Take early risk, a lot of risk early on, take jobs that'll give you the skill set to succeed. And that's why I got into the insurance slash financial advising. I had heard that was one of the toughest industries. So I figured if I can do this, everything should seem easier. And that's ultimately what ended up happening. But now almost 30 years old, uh, I still need some steady income and benefits to uh, survive and get by. So a couple of top agents at my local office had just switched over to a Keller Williams franchise that just came into town. And they're like, oh, it's a higher commission split. Huge network uh, was soon to be the largest brokerage in uh, North America and now the world. Um, so I was very excited about the networking aspect uh, for referrals. Uh, they are very technology-based. Every agent had a custom app, et cetera. So I said, this sounds great. I'll move my license in the meantime while I still try and, and maybe I can bang out a couple of rentals real quickly or hopefully sell a house finally or condo. And uh, beginning of 2013, the recession was pretty much over and the market was hot. We feed off of New York City. If New York City's up 30%, we're up 27 or 28%. And then it kind of fans out the further away from the city you go, the lighter it gets. So we were smoking hot. And uh, all these agents at Keller Williams finally getting the proper training on how to sell a lot of properties were looking for help. So they didn't learn, um, they didn't have enough time yet to build a team to take on all the business that was coming in. So an agent would have three listings and said, I can only do one open house today. Can you take on one of them? And you can have any buyer leads. And that's how I got my first sale through a buyer lead through one of the first open houses I ran. And uh, ironically, he's actually my, uh, still my number one client I've done the most transactions with to this day. I just rented one of his places again. They're moving in on Friday. So <clears throat> you never know how the world's going to be. It's, it's a funny place. So uh, fast forward, it's been nine years as of April and uh, over $80 million in property sold. And uh, a lot of that was actually working just on the buyer's side. I, I hopped on a couple of teams as a buyer's agent. And then I um, was a solo agent the past three years. And just this past month, I signed on to be an expansion partner for a massive team in the suburbs who's looking to have a foothold in the Hudson County market. So. Um, so now I'll be starting my own team under their brand to lead, manage, coach, and uh, sell a lot, help a lot more people find homes in investment properties. But uh, about five years ago, uh, I guess it's closer to six years now, um, a fellow KW agent named Pili Yarusi, she was out of Westfield, New Jersey, one of the suburbs. She, uh, we got in contact. She, I had a referral to send her away. <clears throat> A, Man a Manhattan couple that was looking to move to Hoboken and then they got pregnant and said, you know what, we'll just make the jump straight to the suburbs instead of the condo in between. So million dollar plus buyer, she crushed it. Uh, we stayed in touch. She's telling me how her and her husband are trying to do a lot more investing. They're flipping some houses. In fact, Jersey City, a part of Jersey City was one area that they identified as a lot of potential which was my neighborhood. So I said, absolutely, I can help you out. So I was showing him some potential flips. And one day he walks in and says, oh, you know, I, my high school buddy and I, we just got under contract on 96 units last night. And my jaw just dropped. I said, 
how much money do you have? He goes, no, we syndicated it. I said, why am I missing this term? Out of all the knowledge I have so far in real estate, I somehow missed the word syndication. He said, well, it's basically crowdfunding. It's you know pooling together resources to acquire an asset normally one could not buy themselves. So, and he said, the best part is it's so scalable. So we're, we're going under contract on this 96 units, but we're looking for our second and third deal right now. And they were talking about five markets at that time that they were looking in. So they're going to need help. And I said, well, I had a brief career where I was literally helping people grow their wealth and lower their tax burden. And I have a network of high net worth individuals from the clients I'm selling in Hudson County, as well as all the country club members I caddy for. I think I can help. So that's what happened. Um, his very second deal, I got involved and in. I've done uh, a majority of the deals at Jason, who started URC Holdings. Um, he's been my top operator. And I don't just mean by the number of transactions we've done together, but I mean, performance wise, he is the bee's knees. <laughs> he uh, has, hasn't disappointed yet, overachieved on every expectation, on every pro forma we've had. So he's been one of my top guys. And uh, I was very fortunate that to have met him when I did, you know, I had a whole lifetime of timing never working out for me. And then suddenly things were clicking. But I think a big, big life lesson that I learned from that was um, it's because I created the opportunities. It's because the, when I got a little more comfort, I was always scrambling because I never had any savings. I just never made enough. I was always trying to chase the next opportunity and, oh, this one can make me a lot of money. Oh, this one can make me even more money. But again, going to something like real estate, 100% commission, I had rent to pay, bills to pay, and I'm scrambling and I have to work a side job to support myself to pay those bills until a commission comes through. <clears throat> so as life progressed and some success followed and I had a little you know, security financially, I could take more time to evaluate the opportunities I had. And I think that was the biggest lesson that came. And now that's essentially what I am as shown capital. I am an additional, my value proposition to people is I'm an additional layer of due diligence between the operators, the deals, and um, my investors. So uh, it's like an extra scrubbing of the deal before. Uh, so I'm making sure that I only put the best in front of my, well, I consider <laughs> most of them friends uh, in front of my database. I want to make sure that I'm not getting anyone into a deal, that I wouldn't risk my own child's uh, children's uh, college tuition or my mortgage payments on. So that's kind of my approach to the whole world of syndication. And uh, I know the title of this said 1100 plus. I, since I had to submit my initial uh, information, I'm actually gone up to 1,291 units that I've been involved in, but we've had five, five or six exits. I'm trying to remember uh, in the past year. Uh, so I'm down to about 655 units currently under management. Um, but yeah, it's been uh, quite a ride and um, I learned, learned a lot along the way. And the most important thing is to continue to want to keep learning, which again, you investing the time to be here tonight. I hope that I can help contribute to that a little bit because uh, this is what I was doing. I was on, I was doing about four to five in-person meetup groups a month. Uh, Trying to, trying to hear it from as many people as possible. And then the networking. It's my world gets smaller every day. I come across people like, oh, you knew of this person who does this thing and that thing. And it's even led me into other investments. So I've even gotten into some venture capital deals where now I'm a partner in a cannabis company, um, initially a hemp cultivation business, which uh, has also turned into retail in the meantime, and very shortly, hopefully, knock on wood, uh, we might have a partnership coming together to even get into uh, the THC side of things in New York. So, um, and I'm involved in an online uh, arbitrage business with Amazon and some other things. But again, I'm able to stop and evaluate and um, do all my due diligence because I've built up 
the opportunity to take the time to do that. So it's uh, just gets more exciting every day. And uh, I'm able to connect a lot more dots along the way because of it. Mm -hmm. um, so then I have a question. So, mm -hmm. so basically, like so your preferred row is really capital raising, right? That's what I, I get predominantly um, in most Investor relations, capital raising. raising. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right, right. And um, so you kind of lever your, you know, extensive sales background from before and, um, you know, within real estate as well as with other, other clients as well, other high net worth clients. Mm -hmm. So to what extent like your financial services or like Lincoln Financial and those relationships helped you or was it more of the kind of being an agent in you know, like Hoboken and um, New York City area, that was the bigger driver. Uh, the financial services helped me learn mm -hmm. more about how money works and vehicles that your money can go into. So here I was pitching, you know, main product was essentially life insurance. So many people, including myself, <laughs> thought life insurance was just something to pay the people you leave behind, but it can really be used as a retirement account. And then through the syndication stuff, I learned it can even be used as an investment tool. Mm -hmm. So you can use high value cash um, policies that you can use the cash value to invest in funds. But the beauty of it is you're not pulling the money out. So your, your money's earning interest in the policy in the life insurance, but it's not like you're taking it out. So it's not like you have a hundred grand in there. You take it out and you're earning zero because there's zero money. You're actually borrowing against it. So your hundred grand is still in there earning interest. Meanwhile, you're investing in a uh, syndication, which standard kind of metrics, you're looking for like a double your money in five years, roughly. So like a 20% mm -hmm. annual annualized return. So now you have your money working in two places. And a lot of people refer to this as infinite banking. Um, mm -hmm. yep, exactly. The infinity side doing that. So <laughs> it makes all the sense in the world now. But yeah, you, be, yeah, you become your to, own bank. Just then, so just to repeat, like for our, Ken, for our audience. So what is exactly infinite banking? That's it. So it's, uh, there's the life insurance policy and that, and just kind of <laughs> just for our audience, like, um, to explain the term, like in your, your understanding and like your experience. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I actually haven't done this yet. So don't quote me, but I've heard, okay, it's I've okay. heard it from some CPAs directly, yes, yes, yes. some other uh, people that like that a lot. Um, in fact, if anyone follows uh, the cash flow yes. ninja MC. Oh yeah, yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yep. That's, that's like his business. Yes behind mm -hmm. the podcast yeah okay so, yeah, so he's good. fantastic at explaining it and uh good. so yeah, check so out the podcast cash flow ninja but you're good. basically there's a certain type of insurance policy because it can all be structured differently mm. where you can build up when you make a payment it's like when you pay your mortgage when you pay your mortgage in the beginning it's 90 percent of the payments going towards the interest and 10 percent is going towards the equity in the home, the pay down. And then it starts to shift. And by the end of it, your payments are paying almost all equity with a little bit of interest. So similarly, uh, there's a certain kind of insurance policy where when you make that payment, a lot of it's going into essentially a savings account, uh, a cash balance account versus just paying the insurance company for the cost to hedge if you were to kick the bucket. So if you kind of overfund or build up that cash value quickly, like, oh, I'm gonna start with a $50,000 check in there or something like that, or make just very high payments uh, every month, you build up the savings account, you can borrow against it. So the money never leaves, it's earning some kind of interest, I don't know, 2%, 6%, I don't know what it would be, but it's making money. Mm -hmm. And then you can borrow that to make even more money in an in investment like a syndication or uh, yep. you know, anything else. Yep, yep. So, and then you just, you know, read yep. about it and it's the cycle is the infinite banking. You just keep recycling money. It's what the banks do. 
the bank, you, you put, you open up a savings account or checking account. You, you give the bank your money. They lend it out to make even more money. Mm -hmm. They'll give you 1% back. So, <laughs> or a fraction of a percent really. So um, they're just using your money to make more money. So do it yourself through, you can do it yourself through a life insurance policy. But to answer your question, get back to your question. Um, you know, I, I learned more of the understanding of the financial system through studying for my series six and um, all that. And uh, it was really the sales and understanding real estate through being a broker mm -hmm. that I really learned that helped more on the syndication stuff and investment side of things. Mm -hmm. But even so, when you take the New Jersey uh, or any, I guess, real estate license test for whatever state you're in, you're just learning the stuff that'll keep you out of jail. It's, it's mm -hmm. how to conduct your business ethically, properly, correct terminology. It's not, oh, if I study hard, I'll sell the most homes in this brokerage. You learn zero sales skills. You got to rely on the brokerage to help train you on mm -hmm. how to be a, a good salesperson. So learning the investment side and what investors are looking for, all that stuff, I had to learn on the go and really self-educate all over again. So it was discovering places like biggerpockets.com, mm -hmm. uh, podcasts, meetup, webinars like this and others. And, um, but what, what I've always been kind of my superpower, as some people ask, uh, is networking. And I love to meet people in person, just like my sales business. My, my colleague who brought me over to Keller Williams, he goes, you're, you're not a cold caller. You, you like shaking hands and uh, getting to know people, creating relationships. He goes, you should run as many open houses as possible. So you're meeting these people. And that's what helped launch my sales career there. And vice versa, all the in-person meetup groups have been wonderful. I've kind of been in a depressed funk throughout the uh, COVID quarantine because while I was able to at least talk to people through these video chats, I, it was so depressing not being able to get out and see people. So once things started lighting up, it was, it was nice to start seeing more people. But uh, that's where I really um, got a lot of growth and my network expanded because you can know somebody. Uh, I'm sure a lot of people on this podcast know of Grant Cardone. He's a huge personality in this space. Um, but do you know well enough that you know he's going to properly invest your money and give you good returns? Um, you know, I don't know the guy. He could be selling snake oil for all I know. Um, so I'd rather invest with someone that I personally knew and uh, work with them. Right, right. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And you mentioned working with uh, Jason Urosi, mm -hmm. right? Um, we've had him on our our. Actually, we had him live in New York City. We did a meetup with Jason once. Um, and um, so he's a great guy. I looked at some of his deals, like Yelp performs, um, you know, like very motivated. And, and that's so what have you had like some favorite markets or deals that you've done? Like I know he's invested in Louisville and Nashville more recently and, and others. Yeah, so Louisville, Kentucky was a market like I said, I think he was talking about five markets in the beginning. It was yeah. Louisville, Kentucky, because he had a sister that relocated there a few years prior. So he was regularly going out there anyway. Mm -hmm. And uh, San Antonio, Texas, uh, one of the Greenville or Greensboro in the Carolinas, oh, okay. probably yep. Greenville, South Carolina. I can't remember. Sure. They're both good markets to invest in yep. um, and a couple others. So uh that's where he started his search. He said, we honed in on this and his partner at the time. So here, here's another story of my world getting small. When I finally met his high school buddy that he bought this 96 unit building with and was his partner, uh, I met him like months later and he's, he was my former colleague in the local brokerage in Hoboken I started at. I was mm -hmm. like, Kevin, I sent him a resume when I was at, between jobs, not knowing Keller Williams can take off. So I sent him a resume because he worked for uh, Reese, R-E-I-S, uh, the commercial real estate data company. So he was selling all the information to these large brokerages and research firms that they used to make up all their reports. So when you see a Jones Lang LaSalle or CBRE or Cushman Wakefield, they'll do like their quarterly analysis. 
they're using all the information from companies like CoStar and Reese, which Reese actually got acquired by Moody's uh, Analytics uh, a couple of years ago. So Kevin's still there, loving it. And uh, shout out to Kevin because he had all this access to all this data for free, which he was selling these brokerages for tens of thousands of dollars a month to have access to. So mm -hmm. he was able to pin down and narrow down uh, so much data. In addition to all the other free stuff like citydata.com and you know even pff, Zillow or Trulia, you know, occasionally mm -hmm. there's some good information on there. I don't trust it too far, but <laughs> there, mm -hmm. the Trulia crime report uh, map was really good. I think they did away with it, but that was actually a really good source to make sure we weren't investing in a uh, war zone. Um, so yeah, uh, that's how they started. Louisville, that was the first two deals I did with them. And then uh, the, the great thing, again, timing worked out for me, uh, Jason was quickly rising as a rock star in this space and fantastic uh, networker. He was doing all the things you, you should do if you really want to create a platform to gain attention, excel your business. So it's running a meetup group, starting a podcast, just getting in front of people and getting good quality content in front of people. So, I mean, his early days, I think it was his first or second meetup group that he ran. Uh, he had Gino Barbaro from Jake and Gino uh, mm -hmm. that showed up, flew out to New Jersey. And lo and behold, he was a rising star himself. And now he's you know massive with a huge coaching mm -hmm. business and helping mm -hmm. all kinds of people invest all over the country. And um, he's amazing. And uh, I was so fortunate to be able to meet him. So as well as all these other people that were, uh, I guess the biggest lane of exposure was bigger pockets. So that's where most people kind of got exposed and um, got to know of these people. Uh, Reed Goosens, Ellie Perlman, mm -hmm. uh, Ben Leibovich, all these other people too. So I got to kind of ride Jason's coattails in that regard. And uh, it started happening where people were coming up to me at his meetup groups, which by the way, he averaged about 40 or 50 people every month at his meetup group, which mm -hmm. two or three of the other meetup groups in New Jersey that I go to, uh, four to 10 people on average at those. So you want to talk about networking. I'm getting exposed to a larger uh, cluster of people to work, work with and talk to. And I can't even tell you how many rock stars came out of his meetup group. Just people end up partnering together or someone had a deal, brought in the more experienced person, uh, house flippers that are now buying 200 unit buildings out of state. So it's uh, really amazing um, the kind of community he created here. And that's the goal, right? I, I know you, you have a lot of successful people coming out of your group as well. So um, interact with each other. You never know who's going to be that person that really um, you know, takes you off somewhere. Again, a random person came to the meetup group and we actually did an exercise where we broke up into small groups to do an underwriting exercise that, that week. I was paired up with this guy, Michael, and we uh, explored doing a deal or two in the next six months to almost a year. And then he calls me up one day and goes, hey, what do you think about the hemp industry? Uh, I have an opportunity. I was like, I've a never been too familiar with uh, cannabis, but it's fascinated me, the economics of it. So um, I'm very interested to uh, learn more and get involved. So that's how we launched it, Eternal Hemp. And um, that's been a very interesting journey. Uh, startup companies versus real estate are much different. <laughs> it's uh, a big risk versus reward, you know? So that's why real estate is still probably the best um, bang for your buck, considering the amount of risk involved. So um, still real estate will forever be my core, even though I'm adding more and more business component for more uh, wealth generation, more capital generation. But even um, someone in this new arbitrage business, medical supply arbitrage business, I've been connected to recently, he's making you know, 35, 50% IRR and reinvesting it in syndications for the tax benefits. So it's that's where the wealth is gonna grow for the generations, for the amount of taxes he's saving and continually more cautiously and safely grow that income. 
So many of, uh, I think a few of uh, Jason's indications had a similar error in that range, right? As far as I know. So it's, it's achievable in real estate as well. Yeah, uh, we were usually targeting at least 15% IRR. Right. And, uh, you know, somewhere based on anywhere from a five to a 10 year hold. And then we exited in two and a half to three years. Yes. So that IRR flies up because it factors yep. in time. Mm -hmm. And that's something that, again, as someone that's, you know, steadily making decent money, but, you know, I'm not making seven figures mm -hmm. or anything, not, not yet. <laughs> so to be able to have capital to invest in alongside these deals is a slower process. In fact, I spoke on stage uh, at an event that Jason threw uh, pre-COVID while he still lived in New Jersey. I think it was about 150 uh, attendees. And uh, you, you probably know Alina Trigub. Yeah. So yeah. we were both on stage. Jason was interviewing both of us. And someone in the audience asked, um, do you invest alongside every deal you're in? And Alina stood up and said, I absolutely do. Uh, I make sure that I have skin in the game, help ensure my investors and everything that, um, you know, I'm here with you on this ride. And my answer was no, because if I did the minimum on every deal I was in this year, because the first year I worked with Jason, it was 12 months and 60 offers until we got the next deal. So it took that long from his first to his second, meaning my first. So it was good. I got to warm up some people like, hey, we're getting close on this thing. Oh, it fell through. Hey, we might be able to, might be doing this thing. Oh, it fell through. But at least people were, when the real deal hit, they were now ready. Like, okay, this is like the numbers you were talking about before. But I said, when that first deal hit, we did five in the next 14 months. So I said, if I did the minimum on every deal, I would have had to shell up $450,000. I'm in this because I don't have that. I'm trying to, I'm earning sweat equity. So um, that's how I'm, you know, I'm not going to get rich uh, off that model per se until I'm bringing in millions of dollars per deal. Um, so that's why also it's not just capital raising, um, you know, doing investor relations. Uh, eventually I'll probably start doing more asset managing. And uh, what I've really been trying to do, especially since COVID hit, really pivoted to focus on my broker community, um, especially being part of the largest brokerage in the world. Um, and the other connections I have, try and get in to find more deals. Because if I find the deal, I have more leverage on what to do. So if Charleston, uh, South Carolina, I come across a 150 unit opportunity, I have like two people I would call right away that are pros in that market, done it regularly. Austin, Texas, I have two completely different other people I do. I have two or three groups in Atlanta I would call. So that's where uh, having the network, I have created boots on the ground um, in either partners or experience uh, from people. So I hopefully can find a deal, have a bigger piece of the pie for myself and more control on where things go. So I've been focused on that a lot too. Um, hasn't, I haven't uh, fully executed one that I've found yet, but uh, it's coming. <laughs> Cool, cool. Um, and, and you mentioned like your, some of your like agent experience, let's say with over 80 million in property um, transacted, right? Mm -hmm. I guess like so. Then like a, a, you said a lot of it on the buyer side. So have you been able to do like some of it for commercial syndications or it kind of as a buyer's agent on, on those or, or is that harder to achieve as you need licenses in so many different states? <laughs> well, uh, so you only need... I'll speak on New Jersey, but I think this yeah. is the same everywhere. Mm -hmm. When you get a state real estate license, it allows you to sell every asset within that state. Mm -hmm. So in New Jersey, I could sell you a house. I could sell you a shopping mall. I could sell you mm -hmm. 100 empty acres of land, uh, or I could rent you a $1,000 apartment. Like it, one license to do it all in anywhere. I could sell, I'm, I'm almost at the very top of New Jersey in Ridgewood, I could sell the very bottom tip, Cape May, New Jersey, if I wanted to, but I'm not a member of their MLS. I'm not driving that far. I don't know the market well enough, so I'm not doing it. <laughs> I have my areas I focus on up here and the beauty of re a licensed real estate, you can do referrals. 
So if I had someone looking to buy in Cape May, I can source an agent down there to represent them. And when they close, they'll kick me back like pretty standard, like 20 the commission back to me. So uh, there is opportunity for referrals and out of state uh, deals for sure, where I could legally be compensated on the transaction. Uh, but I'm not licensed in any other state to represent anybody. But I definitely, the funny thing is working this syndication or commercial investment uh, community, it has garnered a lot more attention for deals here in New Jersey. And um, so I've worked, worked hard on a lot of that stuff too. I have a few development opportunities, uh, which are pretty awesome. I've been trying to lock down, but the whole reason I switched to residential and I had this, um, even when I was trying to get back in real estate, I kept thinking, this is just a stepping stone to get back in a commercial, the big boys club. I, I thought it was, you know, sadly, I had the impression as a kid growing up, first of all, I didn't know real estate agents can make a lot of money, but in what I saw around me was, it looked like a bunch of board housewives that needed something to do. Boy, was I wrong. <laughs> so that's what happens having a small mind. But um yeah, so I have uh, quite a few men in my office um, and I have people making seven figures per year just mm -hmm. selling residential homes. So there were a couple of agents in my office that I kind of called them resi uh agents where they had a big residential business, but they also did a lot of little commercial stuff. So, um, and it was kind of funny because one guy in particular, this guy, Joachim, he uh, kind of created a self-sustaining business model out of it where he'd source a, a couple brownstones or a couple, you know, attached buildings, uh, have a developer buy them. So he's getting compensated on the purchase and it's all off market because he found them, knocked on their door, got them to sell. Guy knocks it down, puts up 25 units. And then Joe Keen has 25 units to sell the following year. So he might get compensated on a, I don't know, $2 million acquisition. Mm -hmm. Two years later, He's got you know, twenty million dollars of listings, mm -hmm. so and he's done that over and over with a couple of different guys. And so this project hits, then the next project hits, and he created an incredible business. So I was like, okay, that that seems like a good mix of risk and uh, you know uh, regular income because in commercial, as I discovered, regardless of the recession, uh, even in the good market, it's mostly home runs. And uh, if you look at a lot of baseball players, uh, a lot of the home run hitters will have low batting averages because they're go big or go home. Uh, then you'll have the people that are, you know, more hit the singles and doubles and they have the high batting average because they're just always getting on base. And so that's the point. You want to just keep the money coming in. An occasional home run is awesome. So I figured, let me stick as mostly a residential agent, but I've been growing my commercial business along the way. And uh, I have a good friend, uh, Jeff Manganero, who uh, has his own brokerage, Manganero Real Estate Group. And we actually partner on a lot of deals together. Even though he's a different brokerage, we'll partner up and um, attack deals because he really knows multiple asset classes, industrial, multifamily, development, um, retail, et cetera. So um, he's a great source of knowledge that I can lean on. And uh, we just get a well, get a uh, get along very well. We're both raising our families here in Ridgewood and previously uh, lived in Hoboken. So it was kind of funny when a friend heard our stories and like, you guys have to meet. So <laughs> that's uh, how, uh, that's kind of where I'm running a lot of my business and he has a lot of opportunities. He goes, oh, you might be able to help with this with some of the contacts I know you have and vice versa. So finding people that you gel with and complement each other is super important and who you surround yourself with is the biggest determinant of where you're going to end up so make sure you're around quality people with similar um attitudes so, and missions right right so another question since um you kind of started like through the you know like some of the times like after the prior recession right the global financial crisis 
and and that. So so would you say you expect in the event we enter the recession, you know, uncertain time in the future? Let's say, you know, would you expect that we <laughs> that like uh, crystal ball? <laughs> no, no. no. <laughs> Like the commercial transactions are the ones to slow down more significantly in in such sense, where you know to people involved in the in whichever mm -hmm. transactional capacity, be it uh, agency or other you know like other like um, you know different uh, businesses within real estate, that that would be harder hit, so to say, than the residential transactions. Yeah. So, in my experience, what I've seen, and, and again, maybe this isn't the complete macro correct yeah, yeah. view. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm just a criminal justice major. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, in my viewpoint, what I've experienced, commercial will kind of transaction wise slow down first. And on mm -hmm. the residential side, it's the luxury that stops first. So I'm sure you know, being in New York, mm -hmm. New York kind of almost sets the pace and it's that ripple effect. So suddenly the $20 million condos aren't selling in New York. And um, then suddenly our high price stuff, two to 4 million is not selling. So I actually had a little bit of that issue when the market started leveling off, it, not, it was still going up, uh, but in 2018, Interest rates started coming up a little bit on a 30-year mortgage. We got over 4% again. And um, as typical economics say, it should lower the pricing, which it did. So it was a little more balanced, but still increasing, just not as sharp of a hockey stick. So um, I was working on a team at the time. Our average sale price was a million dollars. Uh, the team leader, she, uh, her niche was luxury waterfront condos, brownstones. So um, the average price in Hoboken, Jersey City altogether was closer to seven, 700, maybe 750. So she definitely sold more higher end stuff and we were slowing down. So I actually left the team. I was thinking about going solo for a minute and a bunch of other teams approached me, ended up going with this other one where his niche was more in the 500 to a million which is, like I said, the average of our market there. So suddenly I banged out a lot more transactions and ended up making more money at the end of the day, ironically. You would right. think selling a few multi-million dollar places would be better. But like I said before, kind of just having that consistency of income, it starts to grow. And the more people, the ultimate goal, really, I mean, we're here to talk about money. I mean, finance is in the, the title. But um, the thing I love about real estate and as you've probably put together, all these steps in life have really come together for me where I kept thinking I was hitting dead ends, but all of them led to actually working together um, to put me in a position that having shown capital and helping people get involved in real estate so they can grow their wealth and lower their taxes, that's actually been very fulfilling. And every job I took, I actually initially did it to help people. When I got into financial advising, I thought, wow, I can help a lot of people grow their wealth, lower their taxes. Isn't that awesome? And I get all these right. friends now that I made. And a quick question, sir, to interpret it. Just curious, because you mentioned luxury. So, you know, sort of slowing down besides commercial potential, really, in the, you know, if the economy slows down and that. So, so let's say you work in, you know, Hoboken, Jersey City, in uh, New Jersey as, as an agent. So, so what's luxury there in terms of price point? What's considered? I have uh, a condominium, luxury condominium conversion in uh, downtown Jersey City right now. So <laughs> I'm curious, what's the cutoff point that you potentially see a slowdown in your in your mind? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, it's, uh, I don't know if anyone's really defined it. A lot mm -hmm. of markets, it's a million plus. A million is still a pretty average price for a lot of people. I mean, we have a lot of first time home buyers spending a million. Uh, mm -hmm. But I would say when you feel the crunch, mm -hmm. um, it's a million to a million and a half plus. Sure, that's, sure. that's where um, part of the initial slowdown. Uh, and, and again, just it's very similar to the whole reason I said earlier why commercial slowed down. People had the money to wait. Okay, well, I'll just stay here and collect. People can just sit in their rental. 
and not have to buy. They can wait out the market, which actually hurt a lot of people in the past six months. Now they're really paying for it. <laughs> Are you seeing a slowdown now with the you know reduced affordability from both higher prices and higher interest rates? You're already seeing it or not just yet? We're seeing it for about a month now uh, yeah. locally in North Jersey. And I think New York, the same uh, nationally, uh, definitely seeing it or have been seeing it for maybe even over a month, but basically since Memorial Day weekend, you know, it's a little tough because when, when the interest rates first started flying up, let alone inflation. We're not even going to talk about inflation right now. So yeah, that's yeah. a whole other bag of cats. Yeah, yeah. But when the interest rates started flying up, the demand was still so crazy. I mean, there's some towns out here in Bergen County where I live now, uh, still suburbs of Manhattan. You know, you can take a train and be 30 minutes into New York. Uh, some of these towns have like seven houses on the market. I mean, there's, there's a town near me, Allentown, beautiful town, incredible mm -hmm. schools. It's not like a Alpine, New Jersey, one of the richest zip codes, like five miles from here, mm -hmm. uh, where the average house is four or $5 million, or even Saddle River, which borders both my town and Allen, Allendale, where they're probably two plus million for a lot of the nice homes. You can get a really nice home under a million, but there was like zero homes listed under a million for a while. It was weird. Like the occasionally $700,000 home comes up and boom, gone but it's just the lack of inventory. So there's just seven overpriced luxury homes sitting there. Um, but really there should be a ton of homes between half a million and a million, uh, but we just need the inventory, but no one has anywhere to go. So they don't go, they don't list. And then no one has, a, there's no movement. So they just have to stay. And in the meantime, people overpay to finally make that move. So it's, it's a little hard to, um, so we knew that when interest rates were going up, the demand is too strong. In America, we're short about 5 million homes. It might even be closer to 5.5 million, I forgot. Mm -hmm. um, and I have a good buddy. He's an incredible analyst of information, Kyle Kovats, uh, also a fellow Keller Williams agent and uh, very involved in syndication. So he loves analyzing data and sharing it. Mm -hmm. And he, I think the statistic he said was something that the shortage of 5 million homes is like the national debt. We need to build 1.2 million homes this year just to keep the 5 million gap. So if we don't build anything this year, then it's like 6.2 million shortage. Like we need to do at least one over a million homes a year just to maintain the gap we have with mm -hmm. the national debt. You know, we're making all this money, but it's still a big chunk of debt we're carrying. So we have an incredible shortage and I've seen so many syndicators, a lot of the, like myself, value add type approach. They're now developers <laughs> and they're building 100, 200, 300 unit complexes. Mm -hmm. A lot of them even um, rent to own been a big thing. So kind of that almost a hybrid where they'll build these kind of townhome communities, which would is like a compromise of apartment living, but closer to the size of a regular house. And they're just renting them. And People just, they want the space. So yeah, they'll leave a place like New York where for the same price of a studio, 30 minutes West in New Jersey, they're getting, you know, 2,200 square foot, 2,500 square foot townhome brand new. Mm -hmm. So it's, uh, it's what's drawing all the people here um, as well as we have amazing schools in most of the uh, state and whatnot. So, so yeah, it's been an interesting transition. Okay, um, hmm. I have another question so kind of <laughs> before we were reaching our time here, but um, I was curious. So have you seen like in, um, since we, we're in a very like, and again, like our webinars are pretty much all over the country, but you know, yourself being involved in the, um, you know, closer to New York City, let's say New Jersey area with lots of plenty of rent stabilization. So mm -hmm. have you seen like a divergent effect of interest rates on stabilized properties compared to others? Because I was looking at, and that's a very like, I'm kind of an analyst, I'm a financial engineer. So I was looking at, you know, the theory behind cap rates. And it's really something like a rent stabilized property that ought to get affected by, you know, by a quick spike in interest rates. I actually put an offer 
on, on one <laughs> in uh, in Manhattan, uh, but um, you know, and it's a, it's a multifamily. But in that sense, so and I told the reason. I said, "Oh, okay, that's quite impressive. Like they were given a pretty sizable discount." And I told the reason is, well, that's there is no NOI growth there. That's there's just none. It's rent stabilized. I mean, it's, I mean, it's minor. You know, it's uh, it's not going to grow with inflation. And we have interest rates rising, so that gets really affected. And yeah. so I was curious, like, if that's something you've seen. I don't know if it's because, after all, as an agent, like, primarily, perhaps you could deal with more like selling to actual homeowners and and so forth. But it's a it's a northeast investor question, I guess. <laughs> you know? Yeah, you know, it's funny. Um, we just had a situation on a deal. I'm currently. Um, we actually just got an extension. We we should have closed like a week or so ago. Um, it's 118 units in Buckhead, uh, Georgia, which is uh -huh. like, it's Atlanta, uh, yeah. but one of the closest, nicest, I mean, celebrities and musicians live there. Uh -huh. If they're in Atlanta, that they moved to Buckhead, great mm -hmm. schools, all that. So um, I'm involved in that, a deal there is a 506C, so I can talk about it, accredited investors only. Mm -hmm. um, so we actually were set to close and our lender came back and renegotiated with us. So we had to, or they were trying to renegotiate the deal, which they're a little infamous for, <laughs> but uh, even as big of a shop as they are. So we ended up switching lenders, um, which the seller, investor himself, so he kind of understood the landscape and he's getting on the other end when he's trying to buy stuff. So he understood. So we actually ended up getting a new lender um, and a one and a half million dollar discount uh, and another month or two to close. So uh, we're still still working on that. Uh, but just goes to show even the lenders are coming out like, uh, we don't want to close this. We feel like, you know, we're giving up okay. too much. So you actually got ended up getting a discount due to the sort of, well, you can't finance the deal in another way. Due to sort of the rising interest rates. That was the case there? Or? Yeah, like basically the time we were under contract, yeah. rates went up so much. Hey, the lender's like, we don't want to commit to that anymore. You got to exactly. knock down that price or accept this right now, et cetera. So uh, it ended up just not working out. We kicked them to this curb and um, it was a more uh, unique kind of group that one of the partners had come across. So uh, they're more of an equity group that uh, was going to service the debt. So it ended up working out and had the right terms and everything. So um yeah, we're closing in August on that, but Ooh. still a little over a million to raise for that. Ooh. So that'll be done in no time. Yeah, well, that's that's pretty awesome. So any uh, last questions, um, guys? Like I know I put before, if you want to put them, put your questions in the chat, or since I've been primarily <laughs> primarily <laughs> interviewing myself. So if you guys, if anyone has any questions, I'm actually gonna type in my uh, info in the. Yeah, absolutely. Area. absolutely. If you don't want to reach out directly, feel free. Yeah. With my cell phone. Yeah, let us yeah. know the best way. Yeah, the best way anyone can reach to you. Okay, so it's done at uh, uh, seancap.com, 973-919-7311. Yep. Should I say that? We can cut it out if you like. <laughs> cool. Nailed it. So, yep, <laughs> yeah, so that's, um, yeah, so that's the best way. And do you have a website as well, Dan, or? No, okay. I, uh, <laughs> that's the, uh, some of the administrative stuff I dropped the ball on. Sure, but sure. One day I'll have a website, I'm sure. <laughs> great. Well, it was very nice meeting you and um, thank you for sharing like all the you know, great insights here with our group. Uh, so that's going to be on YouTube for everyone. And thanks for, yeah, thanks for to everyone for joining us here tonight. And yeah, thanks for the insights, Dan. Thank you. Pleasure being here. Appreciate great. everyone's time. Wish you luck in everything. Cool. Thanks.